Okay. All right. Hey, welcome on back here. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, it's a little couple minutes after. Uh, let's see. I guess this is uh, day three, and so our third chapter. And uh, you're going to see here. It's I call it a practical chapter. We're going to actually finally take some of these theoretical ideas. Um, and well, I guess we already did yesterday a little bit with the capacitors and stuff. But but now we're going to do with. Uh, uh, practical things like currents and circuits and whatnot. Anyways, uh, I do got, I think, a piece of good news because this semester started off uh, with a really hard chapter, 18. It, it was hard and there was a lot of pieces to it. Even the last chapter was significantly hard, but this one, um, and I'll never say it's easy, but I would say it is the easiest so far. Um, it might even be the easiest for the semester. Well, maybe I shouldn't say that. I don't, I'm trying to think of the other ones during the semester. Pro probably not. But the uh, chapter is pretty straightforward here. So it's chapter 20, and we're trying to do three things here today. Uh, the first one is to introduce you to what is called electrical current. Uh, the second piece is what is uh, resistance. And then finally, the third piece is Ohm's Law. And uh, basically, the great work done by Ohm. And uh, you'll see some of that. And current and resistance, and then also voltage from the last chapter are all tied together in what's called Ohm's Law. And so the best place I can, I can start here is to say, OK, what is electrical current? And I'll start by saying, for short, we often just call it the current. Uh, I, hopefully that won't confuse anybody in the th sense that they might think it's current in a river uh, flowing down. Uh, obviously, it's not that kind of current. It's not water current. But there is a very good analogy between electrical current and water current. And so that's why I want to bring that up. In fact, I even have the aquarium over here so I can start showing you the uh, water current and uh, you'll see hopefully the analogy uh, and, and so here's kind of my first definition what is current it is the flow of charges uh, and again maybe I should say electrical charges but I'll just drop the name I hope it's self obvious we're talking about electrical charges we're talking about electrical current and so this is this movement of charge in fact this kind of brings me to this first picture in your diagram uh, and so I set it up here on figure number two and here's what your author is trying to say if you could then picture um, a wire and so I grabbed a little wire right here and this wire then is kind of like a pipe kind of like water flowing through a pipe it's why I also brought out the little aquarium here the aquarium bring it closer to the edge so maybe you can see there is a water pump down here and the water pump is uh, over here and plugged in it's got a little on switch and so it's got a little rubber hose sitting up here at the at the top and so if I turn it on you'll see this flow of current you'll see the water flowing through the pipe and you probably are picturing these billions and billions of water molecules moving through the pipe. That's the same picture I want you to have here for our circuit. That I've got billions and billions of little charges and they are moving. And in this case, they move from the left to the right. And so they go through this little surface area. And so that is our definition of what is current or I should say that's the conceptual definition of what is current because the the mathematical definition then uh, will be this the symbol that we like to use for current is the capital I and since it's a flow we like to label how much flow per time and if this was water flowing in that pipe right there, I might say so many gallons per second or per minute, right? There'd be some unit of time. And of course, if I said gallons or if I said liters, you would also know that that means a bunch of water molecules. I'm not sure how many water molecules are in a gallon. I guess we could 
look up uh, the dimensions of a gallon and figure out how many water molecules are in a gallon. But we could either describe it as the number of water molecules per second, which would be a big number, so we don't like to do that. We prefer to then say the number of gallons per second. And we're going to do the same thing. This up here would be the amount of charge. And if you remember from first chapter, so the first day, uh, we said that the electrons have a small amount of charge. It was at 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And it took 6 billion billion electrons to make one coulomb. So it takes a lot of electrons to make one coulomb. But that's how we're going to then label our current. When we say the amount of charge, we mean how many coulombs does it have. And so the units here would be coulombs per second. How many coulombs do I have each second? Uh, and so I'll say it again. If these little charges up here represented uh, electrons, uh, let me be careful with the plus and minus. More on that in just a second. So let's just say these are charges, but they're positive and they're uh, flowing from left to right. Uh, I would say here, if I had six billion billion of them in one second, I would have one coulomb per second. And so I would say the current is one coulomb a second. And in honor of Ampere, we label this an amp. And I guess I sp spelled it out and I should have just put A. So A for amps. So there's our beginning for today. Uh, we have a new quantity called current. It is really just the rate of flow of a bunch of charges and a new unit that goes with it called an amp. So in mathematical terms, I guess it would look like this. I would say I equals, and there would be a Q. You might call this even a delta Q over a delta T, saying, OK, how much charge flows in a given amount of time? And of course, then what is pushing that is a fun question in itself. But I thought I'd do something a little different here <coughs> today. I, I think because it's easier material, I think because we have more time and because I never seem to actually get to it, uh, let me jump to this section and let's read number five here. And let's try an example here. Number five says, I have a large lightning bolt that has 20,000, and there it is, A, A for amps, 20,000 amps of current that moves then 30 coulombs of charge. What is its duration? And so you can see that they've given you two of these three. So the uh, current, and I forgot now what it was, uh, where'd it go here, large lightning bolt, 20,000 amps. So this part of it is the 20,000 amps. The amount of currents is the 30 coulombs. And so the unknown here is the duration, the time. And so I can rearrange this and put 30 coulombs over 20,000 amps. And let me pause right there. An amp is a coulomb per second. So the coulombs are going to cancel off. The bottom flips. And we've got our first calculation. And pretty straightforward one. It's 30,000 divided by 20. One, two, three. I mean, 30 divided by 20,000. And so we're talking about 0 0.0015 seconds. So not a whole long time. And you would expect it. It's just a, it's a, it's a lightning bolt. Uh, and so you expect a lot of current in a short amount of time. Um, and then, of course, that's still quite a bit of charge. But again, maybe that gives you this idea of this flow. Now, if we keep going with our physics here, the next se section is saying, okay, then 
what makes this current flow? And so I will put I here for current. Uh, maybe even underneath, just to remind you, I'm going to put amount of flow. What determines how much it flows? Well, this is where ohms, our ohm, comes into the picture. He began to think about this. And he put, a, he put a couple things together, working with water in particular, but you could also see it if we go back to Newton's second law. Maybe you remember that the acceleration of an object is force divided by mass. Uh, in other words, you're saying what actually pushes an object is two factors. Uh, one of them is, you know, the effort, the push, but the other one is the resistance, the, the, the stopping of it. And that's Ohm's thinking. Ohm's thinking is that if you have a push and a stop, there is some kind of balancing going on. Maybe a better word is resistance. Because I don't mean that you actually stop the water, or in this case, the charges from flowing. But there is something opposing it, something that is keeping the water from, I mean, from the charges from flowing. And I keep thinking of water, and I'll go back to the water, because this is a really good example. If I turn this on again, here's this flow of water, and you can see that there's a, it's a pretty significant rate of water flowing through here. But I would say that I could adjust the rate of flow with two factors. The first one is changing the push. Now, maybe I'll scoot this forward a little bit so that you can see this little device back here. But this device has a knob that changes the amount of voltage or the power that I'm giving this pump. And so if I were to turn the knob down, you'll begin to see that there's less of a flow. So part of the reason that determines the flow is how much push do you have? How much are you pushing the water? I'll turn it back up. We got a high flow. Now, leaving that alone, so not changing the push, I could change the resistance. I could take this rubber hose and maybe with my left hand here, pinch it. And I... I'll point out that I still have the same push. Now I get less flow, but it's the same push. And so how much actually flows is determined by those two factors. In fact, water coming out of your sink is a really good example of changing the resistance because what is pushing the water out is the water pressure. Then this little valve right here, you could open and close it, making it either small or big, depending on how far you turn it. And so if I close it up, I get less of a flow. And I would say because I have more resistance. And so in this case, adjusting the flow is by only adjusting the resistance. We can't change the water pressure. We, that's determined by the water company or maybe a little regulator that we have out coming into our to our building but in general we don't change the the water pressure and so my point here is putting the analogy of kinematics or dynamics I should say and the idea of water flow Ohm's gonna do the same thing here Ohm's gonna say let's go ahead and make a hypothesis and then test it that, hey, there's got to be something pushing it. And I guess the push is what we learned last chapter, right? It's getting its energy from somewhere. That, that is the voltage. And so the push is the voltage. You increase the voltage, you increase the push. Uh, on the other hand, you have this thing called the resistance and you can then adjust or change the resistance and that would change the amount of, of flow. So putting that in an equation form, I guess I would write it this way. That the amount that actually flows 
is equal to V over R. Now I'll point out that like any equation that has three variables, if you know any of the two, you can find the third. And it also means you can rearrange them for each independent variable. So I'll put the other forms because sometimes we like to think of Ohm's law as this, where we say V equals IR. And other times we like to think of it as R equals, let's see, what would that equal? That would be V over I. And so whichever way is most appropriate, and I, I like to do this, uh, this is how I like to think about Ohm's law conceptually, because conceptually it's just like Newton's second law that it's saying, okay, I've got two independent factors that determine how much flow. So I like this equation from a conceptual point of view. But when I'm solving problems, I don't like to have a quotient if I don't need it, and so I like this one. And we often deal with the voltage, as you'll see in the next chapter. And so this is probably the one I will use a lot when I'm doing equations. And this one is nice in the sense that it'll give me a chance to talk a little bit more about resistance. Because as I said a moment ago, the whole idea of this chapter is introduce you to current, which I guess I already have, and the units. And then the second two things is resistance and Ohm's law and then all the consequences that go along with that. And of course, that's why this comes into play. This whole idea of resistance is, well, what is stopping or opposing the material or the electrons or the charges from moving in the wire? And that's thus resistance here. And so I would say that this step right here, R equals V over I, or this little phrase here I like to say is what makes up resistance, there is four reasons. There are four factors. Now let me hold off on those four factors in, in, in just a second here, but I like to then say, if you look here at your unit analysis, uh, kind of our first understanding of what is resistance is looking at the units. This would be in volts. And this would be in amps. <clears throat> so if I were to say the resistance is, say, and let me just grab one of these resistors. Here's a really big one so that we can kind of see it and talk about it here in class. This has a resistance and it says the resistance is 10. And so I would say, okay, the resistance is 10, and then the units would be volts over meter. Now, what does that actually mean? Uh, what that means is, if you are trying to run current through here, 10 volts per meter, I mean, <laughs> 10 volts per amp, meaning you would have to connect this to a power supply of 10 volts in order to get one amp. So if I were to kind of do something like this, here's my power supply, and so maybe you can see the numbers better. Let me scoot that back over. But if I were to bring my power supply forward and then turn up the voltage, okay, how come my voltage is not changing? Oh, because I got the wrong number. Thank you. 
Okay. And so I'll put it roughly at 10. And so what this is conceptually saying here is if I take a power supply at 10 volts and run it through this resistor, there should be one amp in here. And so that's this idea. And you can see then if I had a different resistor that has 175 for its resistance, which I won't bother to hook it up, but that would be this one. This one, if I read across the top, says, hey, this has a resistance of 175. And what that means is for you to get one amp to go through here, you've got to hook it up to a bigger push. You've got to hook it up to 175 volts. And so it's just a measurement of how much is it resisting. And it's really no different if you want to think about this as the amount of mass. The amount of mass, you could have a small amount, which means it doesn't take much of a push to get it to move. Uh, if you have a big mass, well, then you have to get it more of a force to get it to move. And in fact, since it was Ohm who came up with this whole idea of resistance, we give him the honor and we refer to this then as 10 ohms or 175 ohms. And so resistance is measured in ohms in his honor. And so I'll say it again, this beginning part is trying to get you to understand A, what is current, and then B, what is resistance. So, so current is the amount of flow, the resistance is what's stopping it from flowing. And what's pushing it, we covered last chapter, which is the voltage. And then, of course, that means we've got units for these two new things. And so the new unit for current is, of course, called an amp. And the new unit for resistance is called an ohm. And that's not a very good symbol. Uh, let's see, can I draw it any better? It's supposed to look... Maybe that's just as bad. But it's the omega, the capital omega from the Greek alphabet here. And so that's what we mean by the resistance. And so, like I said, Ohm's law then can be viewed in any of these three forms. And like I said, this form I like in the sense that it gives me a better understanding of what is meant by resistance. But conceptually, this is a better form because it says this is your push. So the bigger the push, the more current, or this is your resistance. So the more resistance, less current. And so that's the big factor of how these two uh, play out. In fact, as I was starting to say, is there's really four reasons why there is resistance. See, at this point, I've just said there is resistance. I haven't really said why is there resistance. From your distance, you probably can't tell, but these two resistors, if you will, are really just wires wrapped around on a coil. And so it's really big so that you can see it. Most resistors aren't this big. I mean, there's something like here's a little box of resistors. Here's, you know, a resistor. And this is actually even a pretty big one. Here's kind of a what I'll call a normal size one here. And so they're 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 actually on the what I'll call the the small size because getting the current to go through depends on four factors. In fact, that's what this little demonstration here is maybe to help you visualize it. Imagine this is a wire, okay? And so here's my, my wire. And so if I take my wire here, then what's inside this wire? Well, there's atoms. And if I let maybe this represent a charge trying to move through, you can see 
that it has troubles moving through because it keeps hitting the atoms. And so I would say that certainly one of the reasons of why it is hard for the charges to move through happens to be just from the material itself. You know, why can't it fit through? Um, I'll put this, I'll start to put this in equation form. And so we like to call this rho for the resistivity of it. And the resistivity is the factor that has to do just with the material itself. It has nothing to do with other factors, like how long is the material is one of them, but this is what we call the resistivity. And so every material is gonna have its own unique number. Let me come back to your author's work. Uh, let me jump back. Uh, what page was that? Uh, let me try 875, see where that gets me. Ah, I was close. I think it's the table before that one. Yeah, right here. And so your author says, well, let's look at this resistivity. And you'll see things here that flow really well and things that don't flow. Uh, so well here. And so maybe, uh, do they have, oh, here we go. I was looking for copper. Uh, but it looks like they put all these together and said, no, that's an alloy. Maybe I didn't scroll up high enough. Maybe the table's bigger than that. Ah, yeah, here we go. So I thought they started with some good stuff. All right, so the good flowing material would be silver. Um, so silver has a resistivity that is the lowest of all of these. And so if you really wanted things to flow, you make your wires out of silver. That's very expensive, so we don't do that. But the next one on this list is copper, and that's what we do do. We use a lot of copper. Most of our wires are copper. It's rare that we find any out of aluminum anymore, but copper and gold and aluminum and tungsten, there's our light bulb filament right here, and on down the, the list, and steel and lead. Anyways, they all have their own unique number, and so this is my way of pointing out that, hey, be careful. Uh, when you do a problem because they'll probably just tell you the material and they expect you to figure out what the resistance is based on that material. So, so this is one of the reasons why. Now if I come back here and say you could maybe see other reasons why it is hard for these electrons or these charges to move through. Hmm. These plastic ones are a little too light. But I think you can also see how long is it. It's going to be harder to move through something that is twice as long because it has more atoms it's going to run into. So you would expect that to be directly proportional, and sure enough, it is. And so I think the next one to mention here is how long it is. I'll put L for its length. And then hopefully another piece that you see would be the diameter of this wire, or more appropriately, I should say, the cross-sectional area. Again, you can kind of see how they get all jammed up if the wire is kind of narrow here. If I put a bunch of these on here and let them kind of flow through, you can see that if they have to get into a narrow range, uh, that's tough for them. They get in each other's way. Oh, that's really no different than what we were doing back here when we were pinching the rubber hose. We narrow it. They, they, it it's tough to get through. To get all those through, they have to go really fast and they just kind of run into each other.
And so definitely the cross-sectional area comes into play. And that would be inversely proportional. So in other words, if you have a big pipe or big wire in terms of diameter, you would kind of expect it to go through. The hardest one to see is it has to do with the temperature. You don't really see that in my model, but let me try to illustrate and use what we learned last semester. If this is again my wire, and I'm trying to get these to go through, you of course see them hit the atoms. But in my model, these atoms are these little nails, and in reality, these atoms are moving, they're vibrating. That's what temperature is. And you could say then, in effect, if you warm it up, they would move back and forth and take up more space. It would be like me putting fatter nails here or bigger nails. And if I were to put bigger nails in there, you could see that they're more likely to hit the nail and it's harder for them to get through and around all the nails. And so sure enough, if you were to increase its temperature, you change the effect of moving through. Uh, we like to put it this way, that this number right here, because this is really the, the number, if you will, actually looks like this. There is some value at a given temperature, then it increases by some small number based upon the temperature increase from whatever we measured it at. And so this number right here is the temperature coefficient and it's in table 2 here. Let me show you. And let me while I'm still here at table one, scroll down and say, okay, so these are the numbers, but look at the bottom of this table. The bottom of this table says, these are the resistivities of various materials at 20 degrees Celsius. So that's roughly room temperature, and so that's why we use it. And so if I'm in this room, and I have this wire right here, and I go, okay, well, I'll go ahead and say, what is the resistance of it? I can measure its length. I know it's made out of copper. I can measure its diameter. And I would use the resistivity at 20 degrees because I'm here in the room. But if that temperature goes up or down, the resistivity is going to change. And that's what your author lists right here. And so here is, and I'll just pick on copper again, here's the coefficient, the temperature coefficient. And so here's copper. Uh, by the way, I should emphasize, please don't confuse this with the thermal expansion coefficient, because we used an alpha there too, and that can easily be done. So we're, I'm not talking about that. This is just the coefficient for the resistance. And so this number right here for copper, 3.9, would go right in here. And then I would you look up this number for copper, and so this would be the resistivity at copper. And then, like I said, if I'm at 20 degrees, um, I guess I would just put a zero here, because this is how much does it increase or decrease from the number you're putting here. And so let's just say it got really hot here today and it goes up to 30 degrees Celsius. And then I would go ahead and put a 10 right here because it's 10 above this number. So this number in the table is given at 20 and so I would go 10 above that. And so you can see that it would be 1 plus a little bit. It's not much because remember this alpha is a small number, but it does change based upon that, that factor. And so that's what I want to emphasize here is that there are four factors that determine the resistance. All right.
And again, so in summary here, I, I, I would say that first we did current and the units that go with current. And so the, that's this whole amp thing right here, still on the board. But then we did this resistance. And so the resistance is a little harder, a little deeper to, to understand. But at least we got the units are in ohms. And the meaning of these units is volts per amp. And then now we see conceptually, I hope, what, and, and even mathematically, how we can get the total resistance of some material because it depends on these four factors the material the length of the material the diameter of the material and the the temperature of the material so why don't i try a couple of examples with this why don't i flip again to the end of the book here and instead of trying to wait till the end and never having time to work some in let me go ahead and say all right i, I made a little list here uh, why don't we try number 18 and 19. Uh, those are straight from Ohm's law here. And so if I come over here to the end of the chapter, uh, 899, and scroll down here to number 18, 18 and 19 both, you'll, you'll see these are in the, the area that say Ohm's law. So 18 says, what current flows through a bulb that has three volts flashlight uh, when it's hot and its resistance is 3.6? So they tell us it's already hot. And by the way, they're not really asking us to do anything about the fact that it has a certain length and a diameter. So I, I don't think this is quite as far as I need to do for this problem. But I will point out then, you might have noticed here that they are saying it's already warmed up. So this temperature is kind of high. And so the, this is the high resistance. In other words, when you first turn on a light, it has a low resistance. That's why when you first turn on a light, you get a lot of current. Uh, then the light warms up and the current goes down. You probably notice that the most when you ever see a light burn out. They most likely will burn out when you turn them on. Because when you turn them on, that's when you get the most current. And you give it a lot of current, and then it warms up. That makes the resistance go higher. Then the current goes down. So if they can handle that first big blast of current, they could probably handle the smaller current. Now, if you left the light on for days and days and days and days, eventually it's going to say, okay, I'm burnt out. <laughs> and it just melts away, the little filament. But if you had left it on for like just one day and the filament started to deteriorate, but it was still strong enough to handle your low current, and it's low current because the bulb is hot, then when you turn it off and then the next day you go to turn it on, it goes back to that high current and then, oh, too much for it. And so you'll see this big flash right when you turn it on. So that's kind of an indicator that you get a lot of current right when you turn on the bulb. Because again, it's cool and then it, it warms up. So in our case, let me just put Ohm's law back here on the board. And so current is voltage divided by resistance or voltage is current times resistance or, and I won't even put the third one, like I said, the third one is kind of nice to give us an understanding of what is resistance. <clears throat> but it's usually these two that are the ones that show up mathematically. So this one talks about how much voltage or energy do you have, and this one talks about how much flow do you actually have. So let me just put those two and come back and read this question again here. It says, what current flows? And so we need voltage and resistance. So we have it. The voltage here is 3 volts. Uh, the resistance is 3.6 ohms. And so I'll do the numbers, but maybe maybe pay more attention to the unit itself. So 3 divided by 3.6 is 0 0.833. If I do three significant figures, I think they did say 3.00 is the uh, significant figures there. And then I'm going to put a volt, and this will give me a chance to mention, what was an ohm again? An ohm is defined in honor of ohm, and it's his idea of a volt per amp. So this would be a volt divided by an amp. So I guess then I would flip and multiply. So 
So I'll go V over 1 and then AMP over V. V would cancel and sure enough if we think about our unit analysis we're asked to solve for current and if we watch our units carefully they came out in amps and that's what should happen. We, we should get it in, in amps. And so that's our number 18. Now number 19 is along that same lines. Uh, let's see which one do they ask here. It says calculate the effective resistance. All right, so they're after resistance. So I'll say it again, Ohm's law has got three factors. They give you any two, you can find the third. All right, so calculate the effective resistance of a pocket calculator that has a 1.35 volt battery and, uh, through which 0.2 milliamps flow. Uh, so we do have some tough uh, units to deal with, but I'm going to start here with Ohm's law but written in this form, written as volts divided by current. So the volts was, what did I say, 1.35? So I'll go 1.35 volts. And I don't know why I spelled it out. I guess because I'm always a little bothered by the V, because we've got so many Vs now. We got V for volume. We got, and that's a capital V also, but we got V for velocity. But I think maybe hardest one is we've got a V for the unit of volt, and we also got a V for the quantity of the potential. And by the way, you think that would be easy, the same symbol, right? I mean, think about length. Length, we usually give the symbol for a length, L and the symbol for the unit, meters, M. And, and you almost think that maybe if they had the same symbol, they would be easy to keep together. But they're not. And that just confuses it. And that, that's how the potential is. The potential is measured with a capital V. So the quantity is a capital V. But the unit to measure that quantity is voltage, which is a capital V. And so it's so easy to think that this V is the same as that V. No, it's not. <laughs> they are both supposed to be capital, so I'll try to put little arrowheads over them or little lines over the top of them. Anyways, that's the, the voltage on them. All right, so 1.35 volts. And what was the current on this one? The current was 0.2 milliamps. So 0 0.200, and if you'll allow me a little freedom, Instead of just writing milla, I'm going to go right back to chapter one. I'm going to replace what milla means. Milla means 10 to the minus 3. So I will go 10 to the minus 3 amps. All right, so now I can grab my calculator here and go, all right, 1.35 divided by 0.2 times 10 to the negative 3. And I will get 6,750 and I guess that is three significant figures. I'm not going to count that one. Maybe we'll put a line under there. We'll go back to chapter one just to make it clear. Okay, so there's my three significant figures. But then also let me point out then that the units here would be volts per amp, which is our definition of what we call an ohm. And so the effective resistance, as they say, is 6,750 ohms. And of course, that's a lot of resistance, but rightfully so. We don't want much current. This is a little pocket calculator. We don't want our batteries to run low. If we could build our electronics so that they can operate on very, very small amounts of current, which we can these days, then our batteries will last a long time. And that's then a good resistance because it doesn't take much voltage and it doesn't draw much current. And our battery is going to last a long time. We don't need a big battery and it's going to last a long time. And so we got the benefits of both of those engineering features here. But this is then uh, ohms. And so let me take a moment again to kind of repeat since the big part of this chapter is to understand what is current and what is resistance. If you have something that has a resistance of 6,750 ohms, what does that mean? Well, that means in order to get one amp to flow through that resistor, you would have to hook it up to a big push, a push of 6,750 volts. And so that would be a lot of voltage 
to get one amp to flow through it. And uh, highly unlikely, I don't have anything like that that can give that much voltage, so I would never be able to get one amp through this resistor. Like I, like I did that smaller 10 ohm resistor. All right, well, like I said, I thought those might be a good two examples here to do Ohm's Law. Uh, but let's also do our resistivity. And so let me give myself a little bit of space here, but leave the main theme of this section. And that is, what is the reason for the resistance? And like I said, there are four reasons. One is the material, one is the length, one is the cross-sectional area, and the other one is the temperature. And, and this is where I thought number 24 and 25 would be useful to kind of look at. And so number 24 says, what does 24 say? It says, what is the resistance of a 20 meter long piece of 12 gauge, let me put right there, 12 gauge might be a new word for some of you. And so wires and bolts, they're all measured in this gauge. Uh, and the reason they're called that is they actually pull wires. You, you start off with a pretty big diameter wire uh, and, they, and then th that's how it's manufactured. And it's not quite that big and maybe it's about this big and so then to make wires smaller you actually have a metal plate that's got a smaller hole drilled in there and you got to shove this metal pipe if you will through it and then as it comes out the other end you pull it and what happens is it would look something like this. So if this is the piece of metal with a hole in it, and you try to put a pipe <laughs> or a cylinder that has a bigger diameter, uh, if you push hard enough, what will happen is the metal is malleable. That's why it's called a metal. It's malleable. It'll, it'll actually fold back onto itself and as you pull it through you are actually going to get a thinner wire and so it kind of pushes the material back and the wire now becomes thinner and longer. And so if you pull it through one hole you call it one gauge. You can go to the next smaller hole and pull it because you can only you can only do so much of this at a time And so if you pull it through smaller and smaller holes if you do that 12 times you're gonna call it a 12 gauge wire So here's what we have. We have a 12 gauge wire. We have run this through 12 holes And now it has gotten smaller. That's why it can get confusing people look at this and they go How come 18 gauge wire? is thinner than 12 gauge wire. Well, this is why. Every time you pull it through, you make it smaller and smaller. And so as the number gets bigger, the wire actually gets smaller. Uh, now, maybe I spent too much time there. That's probably more for my engineering students than you guys, because we won't really need into this 12 gauge. We just need to know what is the size of the wire after it was pulled through that last hole, that, those tw that 12 little hole and and here it is it's 2.053 millimeter diameter okay and so we want to know the the resistance and so that's where this little equation comes into play as i said the resistance depends on four factors and uh maybe i should write it so that all four factors show up in the equation all right, so the first factor I need is this right here. What is the resistivity at some temperature? And then say, well, what temperature am I operating at? And so to get that resistivity, we need to go back to table one and figure out what we have. And of course it says it is copper. And so going back here, ooh, what was this? It was about 875. 
a little higher. Ah, here is our copper. 1.72 times 10 to the minus 8. So, 1.72 times 10 to the minus 8. And this example will give me a chance to say, well, what units go with it? Well, we could study the equation, and we will, but I'm also just going to walk over here to the chart and say, it says the resistivity is an ohm times a meter. Okay. So I'll put in my unit an ohm times a meter. Oops. Times a, a meter. And so you'll see that that would be the appropriate unit because whacked right here, you would have meter here and square meter here. So the result of these two is one over a meter. And so that one over the meter, there'll be a meter left here that will cancel with that one so that the end result is I can get a resistance in ohms. And then, of course, I've got this one plus, and now I can go to table two and look up alpha. However, I don't think I need to for this problem because your author and he says that this is the resistivity at 20 degrees. And so I would have to ask myself, you know, uh, am I looking at this material at 20 degrees or less or more than 20 degrees? And I think your author was maybe a little too relaxed on this problem. He doesn't even say anything about the temperature just says, what is the resistance of a 20 meter long piece of wire, 12 gauge wire having this diameter? So I'm going to go with the idea that the author doesn't say anything. It's kind of by default room temperature. It's the 20 and that's why we have our tables listed as 20 because most of the time we're around 20 unless it gets, you know, hot or cold or something. So I'm going to just not even look up the alpha for this one and just say that the change in temperature is zero. Uh, now the length of this, I think I read, what was it, 20 meters over here? And so we've got a 20 meter long wire, okay. And then, of course it's 12 gauge, uh, and so this is the diameter. Well, here we're gonna have to probably jump back to our geometry class because if I have a wire, most likely this wire is got a cross-sectional area that's round. So if you cut the wire, you would see a circle. And so I need to know how to get the area of a circle. And so the area of a circle is pi r squared. And so I'm going to put over here a pi. And I guess here's where then I got to be careful with my units, right? Because they did say that this is a millimeter, but they also said it was the diameter. So I need to cut it in half and change it to meters. So this 2.053 3 times 10 to the minus 3 meters would be the diameter that I can then cut in half and then square. <laughs> okay. And so that is how I'm going to watch my units and then calculate the resistance. And you can then see in the units that I would have a square meter and a meter, so I'd get one over a meter, which cancel with that meter, and so the end result is a null. And so I will grab my calculator, and maybe I will do this one first here. So 2.053 times 10 to the negative 3 divided by 2. So there is the radius, and I will now square it and even multiply it by pi. All right, so there's my area, and that's in the denominator. So let me 
since it's already in my calculator, just go 20 divided by that last answer. So 20 divided by that last answer. Then this would be times 1, okay. And then this would be times 1.72 times 10 to the negative 8. And so 0 0.104 ohms. So about a tenth of an ohm. Which, by the way, if you are curious, a 12 gauge wire, this is a pretty decent sized wire. It's, you know, I guess they tell us the diameter is about two millimeters. Uh, this one right here looks like a 16 gauge. Well, there's three of them in there, so I could be misleading. I don't want you to. Uh, well, this is probably a 16 gauge, but it's got plastic on it. Uh, Anyway, roughly that size of their wire. But your, your house wiring, if you've ever taken off these plugs and all those wires going through there, that's that thick piece of copper. It's kind of hard to bend. It's, it's thick enough to handle lots of current and have low resistance, but yet still bendable that you can put it in your walls and over your attic and twist it and install a new outlet. But your outlets all are using your 12 gauge because they can safely handle up to like 20 amps. And so the resistance is, is pretty low. Okay. Anyways, that's like I said, uh, I thought a good calculation we should try. I know let's try 25 also. Uh, no, 20, nope. What I put here? 24, 33. Look like a good one. And so if I try 33 here, you'll see something that says this. Uh, of what material is a wire made if it is 25 meters long with a 0 0.1 millimeter diameter? Okay, so that'd be about half the size of the 12 gauge we just did. And then has a resistance of 77.7 .7 ohms at 20 degrees. Okay, so again, we're at 20 degrees, so nothing real fancy with the temperature yet. But I will go ahead and write it as part of the overall equation to get started. And I know these other factors, but not this one. And this is the 77.7 .7 ohms. And this is the resistivity. And the change in temperature from 20, and I'll say it could be from any reference point, but we have a table that lists the resistivity at 20. So I'm going to say we are operating at 20. So the delta T is 0. Um, the length of this one, uh, did I think I just read 25 meters? Yeah, 25 meters. And the diameter is 0.1 and then millimeters. So let me make sure I emphasize that, 0.1 millimeters. And again, let me emphasize that is diameter. So I will divide by 2 and then square that. Um, I'll be careful here with my units here, okay, so there is an M, and so now if I run through the math, uh, let's see what I get. Uh, and I will start with the units, uh, because again, if you take this meter and you square it, you get a square meter. And so there's a meter upstairs, so that would cancel. And so this would leave me with a meter downstairs. And so as I bring it to the other side, I will get our standard unit for uh, our resistivity, an ohm meter. And so now maybe I can get a number and then go back to that chart and say, okay, what, you know, what material seems to have this property. And so, oh, let me do this one first here. So I'll go 0.1 times 10 to the negative 3 and divide that by 2. 
and then square it, and then times a pi. So here's the area, and so I'm going to bring it over to here, and so times 77.7, .7, and then I'm going to divide that by the 25, and I'm looking at 2.44 times 10 to the minus 8. And so there's my resistivity of this material. So let's see if I can answer their question here, which is saying what kind of material this is. Of course, I need to jump back over here. And say that 2.44. Ah, gold. So this is, wow, 25 meter long piece of gold. I wish I had that. I could probably get a half a tank of gas <laughs> with all that gold. <laughs> uh, all right. So anyway, so, so, the, so there's the, the, the gold piece of it, or the, I guess I should say, the material part of it. And so this is, you know, a material property that uh, it has. And so, like I, I said, uh, we did the same thing last semester with the specific heat. We, we, you know, we could measure the specific heat of something and say, okay, now you can tell me what kind of material it is. Or the thermal expansion, you can tell me what material it is. And so we're really kind of doing the same thing, except it has to do with electrical properties here. All right, so let's go to part B. Part B then says, all right, now that we know what material it is, it says, uh, what is its resistance now if you warm it up to 150 degrees? So I'll put a little A here and jump over here to B and say, all right, I guess what I would have, and I'll, I'll start with the whole equation again. But it is kind of nice to see something here with the math because you might be tempted to go ahead and put all these things back in. But if you pause for a moment and come back to remembering what you actually did in part A with a length of this and the diameter of this, and a resistivity of this, if you put all these in, aren't you going to get the 77.7? .7? So why waste our time and putting in that and that and that? Why don't we just realize that that is going to be 77.7 .7 ohms? And then this would be the increase. Uh, here's what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say that even though we keep writing the resistivity as rho naught times one plus alpha delta T, we could do the same thinking with the resistance. And that's what I'm actually doing. I'm actually taking the original resistance at 20 degrees and then multiplying it by that extra factor because again these other three factors when you put together those is the resistance at 20 degrees so save yourself a little work and a little effort especially on an exam where you're limited by time and say okay what you know what could i take advantage of and i would say this is a big good i don't have to go through and actually put in the radius or I guess the diameter cut it in half get it a radius square it put it in pi multiply by length multiply by resistivity and I do all that only to get 77.7 .7. uh, I can jump right to this question of how much did it go up by all right now how much did it go up by is what I need to now look up and so this is that thermal coefficient how much did the resistivity or resistance go up for each degree? Now that we've already decided our material is gold, we know where to look here. And so, uh, was it 875-ish? 
And so let's look at table number two and let's come down here to gold. And so gold is 3.4. Oh, and I believe that's times 10 to the minus 3, and I believe the units would be inverse Celsius. Let's just check that. Uh, so, yeah, 10 to the minus 3. And then this will give me a chance to talk about the units uh, for the thermal coefficient. They see you can kind of see it in here. If we, again, go all the way back to Chapter 1 or unit analysis, Right, we've got a one plus a little bit, okay? And since one is just a number, no units, this that we're adding to it must have no units. And of course, this has units of Celsius or Kelvin. Remember, it's a change in temperature. And so again, I'll take you back to Physics 110. Remember, a, a change in temperature, an increase on the Celsius scale, say it goes up by 10 degrees on the Celsius scale, that's the same as going up 10 on the Kelvin scale. And so most of our formulas, our temperature is in Kelvin, as I was saying last semester. But when we're doing a change in temperature, it doesn't matter whether you do Kelvin or Celsius. They're the same size. So we're going to do Celsius for our change. And so that's why your author puts the units for the thermal coefficient as 1 over uh, degree Celsius so that you can then multiply it by how much you have increased above 20. And so I need to come back to this question because did they say it went up by 150 or did they say it went to 150? I mean, that's going to be an important difference. All right, so 33 said yeah, at 150. What is its resistance at 150? So that means we went up by 130. Because all of our numbers, again, are measured at roughly room temperature, 20 degrees. Okay, so now I can get out my calculator and get kind of a number. And out of curiosity, I'm going to start right here because it's these two together that is the percentage increase. And so 3.4 times 10 to the minus 3 times 130 make this by itself 0.442. And so we have one plus. So this is uh, the increase, 44% increase. So we're going to go 77 and increase it by 44%. So I've got this plus one, and then times 77.7. .7, and we're looking at 112 ohms now. And so again, went higher, not a surprise. Went quite a bit higher. Actually quite a bit higher, more than I, uh, I would have guessed. Um, I, yeah, okay, and I, I guess because mostly I'm used to thinking about working with copper and not with gold. I never work with gold. And, too expensive. <laughs> but 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 copper resistance is going to increase too, but not nearly to the to the same extent here. All right. Well, like I said, this chapter could be the easiest one of this semester. It's a pretty straightforward uh, chapter. I uh, I hope so anyways that uh, the goal here is again, as I said at the beginning, the title is to understand well what is current? And what is resistance? And how are they related? And so that's these four examples with Ohm's law and the resistance and the resistivity here. But let's keep going here. There's a f obviously more things we can work with. Uh, let's put a couple of things together from previous chapters here. Um, and so I would say let's do something like this. Uh, I, I will call this our first circuit, if you will. 
Uh, I'll start off by saying, let's say that I take some kind of power supply. So here's my battery. Kind of like we were talking about with capacitors at the end of the last lecture. And I'm going to hook it up to some wires. And let's just say these wires are kind of big. They're not very long. They're kind of fat. So technically they have resistance, but not that much resistance. So how about if I draw them kind of like this, so that you see it with a little bit of fatness, if you will. Because in this area, then I want to narrow it down to a really thin wire. Um, and maybe it doesn't even have to be that long. But just if it is really thin, we're learning here that that would be a lot of resistance. And so maybe what we could do is say, there's the resistance. The, the other part of it technically has some resistance, but it's so small, we like to use the word, it's negligible. And so maybe this number here is 100, and like we did with some of that 12 gauge wire, this is only 0.1. And so who cares about the 0.1? It's too small. What really plays the significant role is the fact that this is a, a hundred. All right. Now I'm going to take this picture and change it a little bit. We call these circuit diagrams. And so I'm going to replace a battery with that symbol. One side is longer than the other. The side that is longer has the higher potential. The side that is small has the lower potential. Uh, in fact, it's the smaller side where the electrons come out. And then I'm going to do this. I'm going to replace this wire here with a little squiggly line that because of the sharp turns hopefully it kind of conveys doesn't look like it'd be hard for the stuff to go through that and to flow through uh, if, I mean if you were driving a car on a road like this you would have to come to a really low speed and make this sharp turn before you can head back the other way and it would take you a long time. It, it, this, this would be an annoying road to travel on. Unless that was the goal, is to go slow and make some fast turns or something like that. But in general, you're not going to make good timing, good flow here. And so we're going to use this symbol for the resistance. And like I said, this symbol will be our energy supply, our power supply, our our push. And then to indicate that we're going to connect them together, we're going to do something like this. And we will just draw a line. And so if we draw these lines, what we really mean is we mean we're connecting things together. We're connecting it from a battery or from another resistor or from a capacitor, whatever the case is. And we're just going to connect our, our circuit together. And so this is called a circuit diagram. This means the battery. This means the resistor. And so I would say I have my first circuit diagram here. Now, let's keep talking because remember, if you have any two of these, you can know the third. So according to Ohm's law, there would be a current here. And current would be voltage divided by the resistance. And so if we're given this number, we're given that number, we can then put them in and we can calculate then how much current is flowing. Well, there's a lot to be said here. And in fact, let me go back to a picture that is early on in your textbook because one of the things 
and I, I should say early on in the, the chapter, one of the things that can throw students off here Ah, well, I'll pause right here. This is quite where I was heading, but I did want to say what I was drawing on the board is exactly what your author was going through right here on figure eight and saying, all right, this is how we're going to draw our stuff. Our power supply is going to be drawn here and our resistor here. And we're going to connect them with, with wires. But you might remember me talking uh, quite a bit about the things that move are the electrons. And I started this lecture with kind of this picture right here by saying, okay, these are charges and they flow this way. But here is something that is a little subtlety. Our charges come in two flavors, if you will, plus and minus. I know when you look at this, you go, oh, well, this says Q, and your natural reaction is to think, oh, those are positive charges. They may not be positive charges. That's not what your author is saying there. Your author says this is a variable Q, and it could be positive that are moving, or it could be negative that are moving. Uh, which is why I like when he does this a little bit better, and there's this follow-up picture, he says the following. The first one's kind of easy to understand. If they're positives, they go this way, then what I would say is the change of charge is positive left to right. In other words, if you could imagine, see these three? Imagine a moment ago these three were on that side. So I would say as they flow across here, as they flow from left to right, this side over here increases by three charges. Fair enough? But look at this for a moment. What if there are negatives moving? Now, I don't know if you caught here, but here he's saying there's an electric field that is what's pushing these positives. In other words, Somewhere over here is this power supply, and we've got the plus hooked up here and the negative hooked up here. Remember I said that the pluses then and negatives would, well, the negative over here would attract these positive. That's what's driving them this way. But if you have the same setup and the things that are moving are negative, they would go the other way. And so if your battery terminal is negative right here, it pulls the positives over. But if your battery terminal right here is the negative, then it pushes the negatives away. So it's not a surprise. We did this in the other chapters. The direction that a positive moves is opposite to the direction that a negative moves. Fair enough? However, let's talk about the current. This is where it can get a little misleading. Because even though the negatives are moving this way, let's look at the right-hand side. Didn't the right-hand side gain three positive charge? Wait, th this is worth repeating. So if three positives go from left to right, then the right side increases by a plus three. But what I'm trying to say is if three negatives go right to left, this still gains three positives. So the direction of the current is the direction of the change in charge. Remember that definition at the start of this chapter? At the start of this chapter, the direction of the current is dq dt. It is not the direction they move. All right, I need to say that again. The direction of the current is not the direction they move. It is the direction that the charges increase. So if it is positives that move, then I would say the current is in that same direction. 
But here's where it gets kind of weird. If the negatives are moving, so if the negatives go that way, this side gains positive charge because the negatives left. So the current is this way. And I'm trying to say in both scenarios, the current is left to right. Do not look at the direction that the charges actually flow. That was not our definition. Our definition of current was not the direction that they flow. It was the direction of the change of charge. The definition of current is dq dt. So like I said, if there's anything real challenging in this chapter, this is probably the concept. And that's why I'm going to camp here for a little bit and say, okay, in both scenarios, A and B, I would say the current is from left to right. Or maybe put another way, it's left to right, and if positives are moving, they move left to right. But on something like this, when the negatives go right to left, we're going to say the current is left to right. So the definition of the current is the change in charge. And both scenarios have the charge increasing left to right. So both of them have a current left to right, even though the negatives are moving. And of course, in reality, as you mentioned many, 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 many times, in that first chapter, what actually moves in this wire are these negatives. And so the whole reason I wanted to spend a lot of time here on that is because you're going to see in a drawing like this, you're going to see me do this. I'm going to calculate the current. Oh, which way is the current flowing? I'll put a little arrowhead. I will say the current is from positive to negative. And so the current is going to go around this loop like that. So there's the current. In addition to that, I will say because of conservation of charge, remember that first chapter, I said that first principle, the conservation of charge, I will know that for every charge that goes up this wire here, one goes across this resistor and one goes down here and one comes back. And so it has the same current everywhere through there, the same number of charges. However, If I was looking on a microscopic level, and I'll change colors to maybe hopefully it stands out, but if I'm looking at what's actually moving, what's actually moving are little tiny electrons. These are the electrons that are moving through this copper wire. They're going from one to another to another. And so the electrons actually move from the negative. Remember, this is why we call it the negative because it's negatively charged and it wants to send out the negatives. And remember the positive wants to suck them in. And so the electrons come sucking in here. And so which, what are you focusing on? Are you focusing on the current? Or are you focusing on the moving charges? And the answer is we're going to do both. Depends what our focus is. So maybe this would be a good time to take a break, but I will say right here, current is left to right, both cases, left to right, yeah. Is there just like a simple rule that like it's, it's opposite of like, like if the negatives moving, if you see like even the negative is moving to the left, it's like the current is going to be going to the right, it's like if the positive is going to the right and if the negative is going to the left, the current is going to the right. Uh, like, you know, like, is there, yeah, so the, so, the, so the rule is, the general rule, I think, is what you're asking, is here's the definition, dq, dt. So if you're working with positive charges, you would have a positive on this side, and which means, and this number is always a positive, so you, you, would, you would always get the change in the charge as the same direction as the current. So that's 
the easy one when you're working with positive. Sadly, we mostly are working with negatives. And so you can see that if I'm working with negatives, I would have how much did it change with a negative in front? And so that would tell me that the current is the opposite of the movement of the charges. Yeah. So if negatives move, we would say the current's opposite to the direction they move. Mm -hmm. If positives move, well, then the current's in the same direction. Yeah. So that's the picture here of all that. Well, like I said, there's certainly a lot more to talk about, but it's uh, nearly 9.30. Why don't we uh, call it a break time and come back in 15, or we'll come back at uh, 9.45 and get started. All right. All right. All right. Hey, well, welcome back here, and uh, let's pick up where we left off. And uh, like I was saying, um, be careful with the direction that the charges are actually moving as opposed to what the current is. And so what I was trying to get at is this little circuit diagram here and trying to get you to understand that you're going to see a lot of these drawings, especially in the next chapter where we start getting more complicated. We'll keep it simple here in this chapter where we'll have just one battery and one resistor. But like I said, that will change uh, significantly as we study multiple resistors and multiple batteries and even capacitors in the, the, the circuit, the stuff we learned last time. But this is, this is all the further we're going here for, for this chapter. This is our, our Ohm's Law here. Um, I don't know if you then could even see this little device. I kept showing you kind of our little circuit here where this is supposed to be the electrons trying to get through the wire. We have a circuit that you'll see more of in the next chapter, but it's this thing here. And we built it with the idea that, ah, here's the energy source. And so there's the battery symbol. And of course, then the charges move out and flow along and they go through some resistors. I want you to see this one. And so this is kind of the end of the path. Looks like I need to do the heavier ones. But as they come down, they go down. And you can see us draw the effects of the resistor. And so that's that symbolism, if you will. Now, if you let me actually hook up a circuit, you can kind of see this whole effect. Let me go ahead and turn on my power supply and turn it back down to how about roughly six volts. And so if I apply six volts to this battery, I would say I have built right here what I'm trying to draw right here. That there's going to be a current flowing through resistor and so the resistance would be the tungsten in the, uh, the, the filament there and so that's this small distance but narrow and so that's where most of the resistance is. And so as I go to analyze this circuit I would come over here and say alright I'm hooked to 6 volts or 6.04 to be a little more accurate. And then I would say I've got these wires and I probably should be a little more traditionally color-coded. Traditionally, the red is for the positive. They're just wires, so the actual color doesn't really matter. But to keep things straight in our head, we, we like to use a kind of a traditional pattern. And so red is the p plus and the black is the, is the negative. And so here I've got my little light bulb. And if I was analyzing it, I would say this. I would say, here's the plus. And so the current comes out. It goes through the battery and returns back. And so the current goes this way. Now, if I was talking about the electrons, I would say the electrons come out here of the negative, they go through the filament and go back that way. But either way, because of conservation of charge, I would say however much is flowing in the red wire is the same as flowing in the black wire, which is the same as flowing through the filament. And so for every one electron that comes out and along this black wire, one electron gets sucked in. Okay. And so there's always the same amount when they go from one to another. Next chapter we'll call that series. 
You already saw that name when we did the capacitor. When it goes from one to another, because of conservation of charge, series stuff have to have the same current in them. Anyways, there it is, the bulb. In fact, I can use this to demonstrate Ohm's law and resistance pretty well. One of the things we saw with Ohm's law is the current is determined by the voltage. More voltage would be more current. What's nice about hooking up this light bulb is you can see it with your eyes. And so if I take and turn up the voltage, higher, 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 it gets brighter, brighter, brighter. And I better not do that too long because it's not designed for that much voltage. So I'll turn it back down. But if I turn it down, 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 maybe right there, two and a half volts, uh, you can see that there's very little current. And so there's not much brightness to it. And so I would say this is essentially Ohm's law, where I am playing with the driving force. I'm playing with the voltage. Now, I can add to this, and remember we were talking about resistance. Uh, these things are our resistors. I don't know if you can see from your distance, but there's actually a, a long wire. It, the wire starts here at this connection, and it wraps around and around and around and around and around and around and around. And uh, this is something like 25 meters long by the time you unwind all these wires, and then it's connected over to here. And this is the one that I was saying, it says 10 ohms on top, so if I connected from here to here, there would be a resistance of, of 10. Now, I'm going to actually use this one, it's the same idea, you just can't see the wires quite as well because they're thinner. And so they're wrapped around more. So it's not only are they thinner, but they are longer, and so it is actually clamped right there and clamped right there and it wraps around and so being a longer wire being a thinner wire from here to here says 175 ohms but here's the other neat thing these is just bare wire so this piece on top actually makes contact part way through the wire in other words if I connect from here to here I can then essentially change the length that the current flows through. So what I'm going to do is disconnect this and I'm going to connect it to here and then uh, do a traditional black one here. I will go from here nope sorry here and so, as you'll see, now the current can go down this wire and so it goes about halfway through the wire. And so, if the whole resistance is about 175, uh, what's half of that? About 87 and a half. So that's probably where I'm at right now. In fact, that's probably so much resistance, the light doesn't even go on. So let's just make sure I got a good connection. Let me put it all the way back here right on this metal plate and so now there is just this resistance of this metal plate and so the ball is kind of bright but what I can do is slide along here and as I slide along you hopefully will see the light getting dimmer and dimmer because again there's more and more resistance in fact, it's probably not too much of a surprise that you are somewhat familiar with this because you, there are many devices that you use where you turn a dial. Now, of course, all you see is the dial, but see on the back side here, you have a long wire connected from here and it's wrapped around, wrapped around, wrapped around, wrapped around, wrapped around, wrapped around. And then there is a centerpiece that when you turn it, you are making contact with that wire at different locations, essentially making the wire different lengths and changing the resistance. And so if this is the current that's going through, say, to my speaker, this would then be the volume control on my speaker. I can turn it up or turn it down and see how much current actually flows through and th through my, my speaker. Okay, And in my case, I'll just turn this down a little bit and ask yet another question. Now that we've learned about current and voltage and resistance and how they're connected together and resistance is made of those four things, 
we might ask this, how much power is being either delivered or consumed by this circuit? And so if I buy an electrical circuit, let's say a microwave oven, and they tell me, hey, you're going to plug it in, and when you hit that on button, it's going to use 1,000 watts of electricity. And hopefully it'll convert that 1,000 watts into heat on my food. Now, to be honest, there's going to be all kinds of other energies on my microwave. Obviously, there's a light on my microwave, but there's also the microwave heats up. So some of the energy that I use from the electricity heats up the electronics in the, the microwave, which is not really what I want, but ultimately it does warm up my frozen burrito. So maybe the thousand watts of electricity is coming, being consumed, but maybe 600 of that or 700 of that goes into warming my food and the other stuff is kind of wasted. And so that's our principle of conservation of energy. And so this is what I was trying to say before the break is let's put together what we've already learned from past chapters. And I misplaced my black marker. Ah, here it is. Is I could say then how much power, capital P, is being consumed by this light bulb. So if you remember, the definition of power was the energy per time. How much energy do we consume in a given amount of time? Now, here I'm talking about electrical energy. And so, if you were to say that a certain charge moved through here, and of course now we're back to that discussion, do I want to say the charge Q moves this way, which would be the direction if positives were moving, or do I want to say the Q moves this way? I'm going to say they're the same thing. Uh, granted, they're not the same direction, but they're the same current, they're the same delta Q. So let me not even specify whether or not there are actual negatives moving, which they are, or whether there are positives that are moving, which they aren't, but it's the same as. So I'm just going to say that the amount of energy would be Q times V. Now, that little formula goes back to last chapter, so maybe I should repeat it since you're probably still kind of learning and actually, to be honest, you're probably still struggling in that real hard one, 18, and going, okay, I gotta get through 18 before I can understand 19. Uh, but we learned that the definition of potential was the potential energy per charge. And so what I'm doing is taking last chapter and I'm moving the Q over to here and saying this is the potential energy. In other words, we have a battery that in my case, I'll just call it six volts because I think I'm at six volts or did I do five? Six volts, okay? And so I set my little power supply here at six volts. And so I would say then, what does six volts mean again? Six volts means you get six joules of energy when one coulomb of charge flows through the circuit. So the total energy that is going to be released from this circuit is going to be delivered by this battery would be the two together. This was my weird example of saying, you know, how much do you ultimately pay at the gas station? You got to do those two factors. One is what is the price per gallon? And the other one is how many gallons do you get? And that's what this is. This is the price per gallon and this is how many gallons. So you multiply that together. That's the total potential energy that is now being released to the circuit. And so it's being transferred from my battery to my light. And so my light then is the energy. And it's not just light energy, it's heat energy. If I were to hold this, I'd feel it really warm. And so the energy that was electrical now becomes both light and heat energy. So that's where this equation comes from. And then if I divide it by time, I'll just put a little T there. But here's the reason for it. I'm going to group that together right there. 
And so a nice equation, as I said, if we put together last semester and last chapter, we can say that if you take the current and multiply it by the voltage, that is going to be the amount of power being either delivered or consumed. So if I am talking about the current and the voltage of this, I would say this is the power being delivered to my circuit. If I'm talking about the current and the voltage in here, then I would say that's being consumed in my circuit. Now, since this is a simple circuit, I only have one thing delivering it and one thing consuming it. Well, this consumes a little bit, but ignoring this, I'll bypass it. So not having this on here, these really should be the same. What is delivered is equal to what's consumed because of conservation of energy. Now, if I had two light bulbs here, well, then I'd say what's being delivered must equal to be what's being consumed by the two of them, not just one of them. But that's next chapter where we hook up multiple resistors, multiple light bulbs, and we'll do that on next, oh, Tuesday, because Monday is a holiday. So, 4th of July. Yeah, <laughs> what holiday? <laughs> okay, so uh, we'll we'll uh, pick this up on 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 Tuesday. Uh, but this is our consuming of the electricity. This is our delivery. But watch this for a moment. Let me also then point out uh, that if I incorporate Ohm's law on here. then I could have power equals and why don't for the first step why don't I just replace the I with V over R and so I would get V squared over R and so these two are the same thing when you put them together but sometimes it's nice to see the alternate forms uh, I could do the same thing the other way. Why don't we rearrange this equation to say V equals IR and put that in for the V and so then I would get I squared R. And like we did with the kinematics, I would say this would this equation or which one to use really would depend on which of these factors you do not know and do not care about, right? See, because this one right here doesn't have resistance in there. So if I have a problem that they don't give me resistance and they're not asking me to solve resistance, this is probably the way to go. This one does not have current in it. So again, this is probably the way to go. If they're not asking for current, they're not giving me the current. And this doesn't have voltage. So oftentimes our equations which one to use works best when we focus on what is not there and what are they not looking for. But I will say they're all the same. So personally I just memorize this one and this one and then I can derive those from that. And that way I don't have to try to memorize all, all three of, of them. But like I said that's the power being delivered in a circuit. So let's try an example here and see if we can actually then use this for something, uh, some calculation here. And so I saw number 43 and it looked like that would be a good one to do. So let's try 43. And 43 says this. Now, surprise, it has to do with power. It says, how many watts does a flashlight that has 6.00 times 10 to the 2 coulombs pass through it in a half an hour use if its voltage is 3 volts. All right, so this kind of sounds like mm, a flashlight, either old school where it has two D cell batteries in it, or new school where it has one lithium battery. You know, the lithium batteries are 3 volts. But we've got the 3 volts, um, and so I would say, well, the power here is current times voltage. And I will notice that in 43 they did not say anything about the resistance and so I'll th I'm thinking they don't want any of these two equations. I'll s probably not those. This one here they 
didn't directly give me the current, but I could go back to the definition of current, which is the amount of charge per time that flows through there. It'll also give me a chance to talk about the units, and so we got to be careful with our units because they gave me the time in hours, and remember, power is measured in what units? Yeah, joules per second. So it's, as you said, it's the seconds. It's a, it's a watt. A joule per second is called a, a watt. So I'm going to want my time in seconds. And I probably want my charge in coulombs. And that's what I want you to see here with the units. Uh, but let me put in the numbers and put in the... Uh, units uh, as well here. So it says that the amount of charge is 6.00 times 10 to the 2 coulombs in one half an hour. Now as you already mentioned I'll do a unit conversion right here and let's see I want to get rid of hours and change to seconds. So that was our way of unit conversion. Uh, and then the only real tricky thing is you got to make sure that your numbers on top and the bottom are the, you know, the same, including the units. In other words, they're equal to each other. Otherwise, you'd be just randomly multiplying by a number. And you can't do that. But you can randomly multiply by one. So we know that there are 3,600 seconds in one hour. And so that's going to change my unit of hours into a second. So here I have coulombs per second, which by the way is the unit for an amp. And so if I was asked what is the current of this, I would now be able to calculate it in terms of amps. And in voltage they say it's three volts and if you'll let me kind of remind you from last chapter, a volt is a joule per coulomb. And so that makes the units perfect here because coulombs would cancel with coulombs. And I'm going to get joule per second. And this takes me way back to the beginning of our time together in Physics 110, the first chapter. And I said, hey, let's look at our units. I know this will sound kind of basic and kind of easy and almost too simple. Like, you know, why do we measure area in square meters and volume in cubic meters? And I'm saying, working with our units and unit conversion is a good skill to develop at the beginning because there's going to be a time, and we're here now, where we're going to get a lot of units that you probably haven't been exposed to. Amps is an example of that. Ohms is an example of that. Volts is an example of that. And so you need to be able to kind of know how to work with the units and converting the units. All right, well, now I can grab my calculator and maybe I'll do this first calculation. So this is 6 times 10 to the 2 divided by a 0.5 and also divided by a 3600. And if I just pause right there, this would be 0.33 coulombs per second, 0.33 amps. So this flashlight has about a third. It's a third of an amp, which not a surprise then when I multiply by three, I get a one. And so this is 1.00 joules per second, which is probably best written as a watt in honor of James Watt and the invention of the steam engine that we said in terms of. So I would say this flashlight bulb is a one watt bulb, which by the way is kind of matching that thing right there. That's what our little flashlight bulb is. Uh, uh, although I got it hooked up to more than three volts. I got six volts here. So uh, doubling that. And I'm not sure what the resistance is. There might be more current than that. Um, maybe not. But uh, that's kind of that first one. Uh, let's try another one. Or was there a part B? No, that passed through. Yeah. 
All right. So the second one I read, wrote down for power is how about 51? And so 51 says with a 1200 watt toaster. And so many toasters, if you like toast, I, I love toast you know, every morning. That's usually what I have. I have a bowl of cereal and two pieces of sourdough toast. And so on a little side, I always read it says 1200 watts on it. And so, so you put it in there and push down the toast. So this 1200 watt toaster, how much electrical energy is needed to make a slice of which cooks for one minute? And then the second part of that question is at costing you 10 cents kilowatt hour, I wish, I wish it was that cheap, uh, how much does it cost to make a piece of toast? All right, well, let's just start with the physics. We'll get to the cost of it in, in, in just a moment here, but the first part is says, how much electrical energy? All right, so this is where, again, I'm going to say put together what we learned today with some past stuff. Uh, starting with this, this is what we put together with path, past stuff. And so I'll say, all right, here the power is current times voltage. But this question doesn't ask for power. This question asks for energy. So I need to do this step and say, all right, energy divided by time is equal to current times voltage. And then, of course, what I want you to see then is if we take the current times the voltage multiplied by time. So these three factors together give me the total energy. Because again, these two factors or maybe I'll do it one at a time. This first factor is energy per charge. And this is charge per time. So when you put this together, you get energy per time. And then when you multiply by time, you get total amount of energy. And so that's the part I was kind of warning you about here. And say, okay, you gotta, you gotta put together the stuff we've learned in the, in the past uh, to make this work out here. All right. Now on this one, oh, actually this is easier than I than I than I said. They they didn't give us current and voltage. They just want to write to power on this one. Yeah. So they say it's twelve hundred watts. So I guess I really didn't need this. I could have just called that power. Power. And so power multiplied by time. So I could have just did this equation. Power multiplied by time is the energy. Okay, but I wanted to show you this. And so uh, I'm glad I did because I was thinking for some of your homework, you, you're going to want to remember that then you, you write energy as power multiplied by time, but then you put in place of power the current times the voltage. All right, but this problem, I don't have the individual current or the voltage, but I do have the power. So the power is 1,200 watts, and the time is, they say one minute? To make my toast cooking for one minute. And then it brings up the unit issue again. Should I do minutes? Should I do hours? Should I do days? No, I should do seconds, right? Because a watt is a joule per second. So this is going to be times 60 seconds. And so if you put your numbers together, it looks like 12 times 6 is 72. And then three zeros. And then remembering that a watt is a joule per second. So the seconds cancel off. And you've got joules. And so it's 72,000 joules of energy, which sounds like a big number, but as you'll see, it's really not. That's, it's really more of a joule is a small amount of, of energy when we get into how much does it cost. But I thought another nice part of this problem was a new unit for energy, because if you recall, last lecture when I talked about the units of energy I said okay we're familiar with a joule 
But when we deal with these little tiny particles like electrons, it's nice to deal with what's called an electron volt. And so I introduced you to the energy you would get if you had one electron and you accelerated it through those parallel plates, if you remember, and it went one volt, then that is the energy of one electron volt. So I'll say it again, it's nice to have different units of energy depending on what you're working with. So for small things, we like the electron volts. But for big things, let me give you another unit of energy. And I think you're seeing it right here. That if you take any unit of power and multiply it by time, any unit of time, that would be a unit of, of energy. So if we're dealing with big powers, let's do a kilowatt of power. And so let me put the unit for power as kilowatt. Not just watt, but kilowatt. For the unit of time, let me put a pretty long period of time. How about an hour? And so let's call this a kilowatt hour. A kilowatt hour is then going to be a unit of time because, I'm sorry, a unit of energy because it is made up of a unit of time and a unit of power. Now you might be curious on how many joules that is because our kind of our base thing is how many joules is it? So, so let's give it a try here. If I just write down here kilowatt hours, I could replace kilo with a thousand, so a thousand watts times an hour. Uh, I guess I could replace the watt with a joule per second. And I guess I could replace the hour with 3600 seconds. The seconds would cancel off, aha, and I'm getting what I, I want. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to answer this question. What is this thing called a kilowatt hour? And I'm trying to convince you a kilowatt hour is a unit of energy. You, you can see here that this part B of this question, it says it costs you nine cents for a kilowatt hour. And unless you've looked really, really close at your uh, Edison bill, your electric bill each month, you may have no idea how much you pay. You may not even pay it. Uh, but if you share an apartment, you probably got to split it with your roommates and say, hey, our bill this month is $100. And we all got to divide it. And there's three of us. So everybody's got to pay 33 and a third. Okay. So you, you split the bill. But if you look down on there, you look at the details, it will say how much energy you used that month. And it'll say so many kilowatt hours. And so a kilowatt hours is a unit of energy. It's a big unit of energy. And you see that right here because if I take the 36 and then two zeros from here and three zeros from here, we're looking at 3.6 million joules of, of energy. And so I will put that right here 3.6 megajoules. And so we will use these different units periodically. So sometimes we will use joules. That's kind of the middle ground. That's mostly what we use. That, that's for things that we do in the laboratory. But for big things like the power grid and for running a whole house for a month or an apartment for a month, we use kilowatt hours. And then for little tiny things, <laughs> we use electron volts. And so that's our unit conversion. So here's what I'm trying to say here is they gave us how much it costs in a unit that is other than a joule. So I just did this problem but I can't completely solve it because I don't have the right units. Although I'm becoming an expert now of getting new units never seen before and converting them because I learned the general idea of units last semester. And so even though I never heard of a kilowatt hour, I kind of get it. Even though I never heard of an amp, I kind of get it. Even though I never heard of a volt, I kind of get it. And so we've got a lot of new units. And there's more to come. We're going to talk about Henry's and 
Farads, and so they just a lot of stuff. You haven't done Teslas, and not cars, <laughs> okay? And, and so there's a, a lot of things that uh, are units that are used in magnetism and circuits that you haven't been exposed to. And so that was going back to the question I had, which class is harder, physics 110 or, or 111? And one of the things I kept saying that makes 111 hard is we're doing a lot of things that you're not familiar with yet. You're, you, this is what I'd call truly being educated, truly saying, hey, I'm being exposed to things I, I, I haven't been exposed to before. And so and then th that's always challenging. So that's why knowing this foundation of switching units is well, what was and is uh, so crucial. All right, so let me do part B now. So what I can put here, and I'll just put little r for rate. No, I'll spell it out because I don't want you to think the r is resistance. So rate. They say that according to them, you pay nine cents for a kilowatt hour. And uh, like I said, I, I wish that was true. Not even close to being true. Uh, I don't know where, where or how long this book is written. No, it's a PDF, so it should be up to date regularly, but maybe it's... And this is from Rice College, so maybe that's the cost in Texas, but it's certainly not here in California. <laughs> All right, so, and we got a weird, I don't know if it's a weird system, but it's a tiered system. You guys ever look at your electric bill? No? Do you pay your electric bill? Yeah. Yeah, so it, it, it's, a total, it's, a, it's a staggering rate, what they call a tier rate. So they give you, it is a, a low rate of about 21, 22 cents a kilowatt hour for kind of this minimal use. And then if you use more than that, you go up. And if you use more than that, you go up. And if you use more than that, you go up. And so it, it's hard to stay under that little one. That little one is really just designed for people just barely to survive, you know. So if you've got no money or if you're real penny pinch and you can you can survive on that low rate there uh, and the, and the if I understand it right Edison actually loses money on that they they don't it's so low they don't even make money so if you stand at that rate you, you what you pay them is less than what it costs them to deliver all that electricity but it's the, the and so most people get into that second rate and if you're a whole family like myself in a house we get to that third rate and sometimes when we're careless like or Christmas with all the lights on. We get into that fourth rate, and then we're like, oh, it's expensive. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyways, but I'm going to follow their numbers. And so I'm going to go with nine cents per kilowatt hour. Okay, you, you might write this as a formula this way. You might say, okay, so here's the rate. Uh, the rate would be the amount of money how about I just put, use that symbol? The amount of money <laughs> per power. I'm sorry, not power, per energy. Okay. So what I'm really getting at then is even though I don't think anywhere in our book do they talk about the business end of calculating something? But I know you've done just basic algebra, and I know you've done this in your algebra class, rates. And so you've got to kind of work this out with yourself and figure out what the formula is going to be. And it's going to be this, that the amount of money I would pay would be equal to the rate multiplied by the amount of, of energy. And it makes sense. We're back to... You know, how much do you pay when you pump gasoline? You, you have a rate of how much you pay, so how much per gallon, which is about $6 a gallon, and then you would multiply by how many gallons you got. So this is my rate, this is my amount per energy, and then how much energy do I use? All right, so that, if there's anything tricky about this problem, it might be the second part of this, where we're, we're looking at the business end of how much does this actually cost, and then the, the rate here of nine cents per kilowatt hour then is where I would say the important calculation comes because it introduces us to a new unit of energy and we have to convert because our energy, I'll write it out first, we know as 72,000 watts Oops. joules, sorry 
and then I've got to do this unit conversion. And so I'm going to put a joule down here. And you can see that this is megajoules, and I'll put kilowatt hour up here. Okay. Um, and then this was 3.6 times 10 to the sixth for the mega. And so that's our unit conversion. Okay, so joule is going to cancel off with joule. Kilowatt is going to cancel off with kilowatt. And when I'm all said and done, I can get the amount of money in units of cents, not dollars. So I will go 9 times 72,000. I'll then divide by 3.6 million. Oops. Let me try that again. 9 times 72, 1, 2, 3, 000, Then divided by 3.6 times 10 to the 6th. And we're looking at under a penny. So even at California's higher rate, which might be five times that or something, we're still looking five times, still a hair under a penny. So the, the actual cost of making a piece of toast is not significant. You're, you're, you're not going to save a whole lot of money at the end of a month by saying, I just won't have toast. That's, that's not where your real consuming is. Your real consuming is bigger things like refrigerators, blowers for the heater, or electrical heating, electrical water heater if you have any of those. Or, uh, and just the fact that it's a, a month is you know, a long time, 30 days. And so you're doing all of this all day long, every day. And you usually have a lot of lights and those kind of things here. But anyways, I'll stay away from the business end of it. All right, well, a couple more things and we're at the end of the uh, chapter here. Um, something that is going to be real interesting and important to us is that when we build this, <clears throat> these circuits and we talk about the current flowing, there are two natural ways to make the current. Uh, we refer to this as either a DC current or an AC current. And I would say up to this point, I've kind of been referring to DC circuits. Uh, what is DC? Well, DC stands for a direct current. In other words, what it means is the current always goes in the same direction. But AC, which stands for an alternating current, really means that the current then goes first one way and then the other way. In fact, you probably were still thinking, and, and I want you to continue to think about this little aquarium pump here. Because what's happening is this pump is always pushing the water in the same direction. This is my analogy of DC. This is a DC circuit. It, it always goes from the pump, through this hose, fades back into the aquarium, and then around. And this is my my circuit. AC, which I can't really show with this pump, would be something where the current went one way and then maybe I kind of switched the pump around and then pumped it the other direction. And so first the current goes, you might call counterclockwise, and then it goes clockwise, and then it goes counterclockwise, and then it goes clockwise. And so it keeps changing. Now, the reason we did DC is the simple things, and I shouldn't say simple because AC is really not that complicated. We're going to build up to it. But these batteries, and so I brought out the motorcycle battery again that we were talking about. Here, you create an electric field. You create a voltage because of the chemicals inside. And as I said, that's the whole discussion about lead, lead oxide, sulfuric acid, and all these redox reactions is a, is a big and long and great discussion that you'll have in your chemistry course. Okay. But what it does is those chemicals 
create a field in a given direction and it's always in that direction. And so if I were to hook something up to this motorcycle battery, and this is the plus side, so plus and minus, the current would always come out here, go around and come back. Always. That's, that's what it would always do. And so batteries, because their push comes from these chemicals, and the chemicals just kind of stay in that same configuration, they always push it in the same direction. And so I would say that I have been talking about, even though I didn't use the word DC, when I put this circuit diagram on the board, a battery and a resistor, this is my DC circuit. And technically this is not a battery, but I'll call it a battery equivalent. It's a little power supply that always makes a positive here and a negative here so the current is always going around in this direction it's a DC circuit an AC circuit I guess would look something like this it would go this way and then somebody would switch it now go the other way and then Somebody would switch it and it would go back. And so the current goes one way and then the other way and then the other way. Now obviously somebody standing here switching it would be kind of silly. And uh, the reason though we have AC and we need to talk about AC is because before this semester is over, hopefully you'll be hearing me say that there are two ways of making an electric field. And so far we've only learned one. We've learned that you get these electric fields from these charges. And these charges then, you know, are set in a configuration in our battery. And so all of our battery devices are DC. However, what we will learn when we get into magnetism is that a second way of making an electric field is by a moving magnet. And so we like to say moving magnets make electricity and they do that in kind of an interesting way in the sense that well, maybe I should have brought that big magnet anyways but uh, if you have a magnet watch what happens as the magnet goes in versus out and so I've taken a coil I've taken some wires and I've taken a little meter here so if I push it in Notice it made the current go in one direction. And when it comes out, it goes the other direction. And so if you can imagine maybe a loop of magnets and then something turning it, perhaps a windmill. And so you put this up to a giant windmill and the windmill spins. And then as the shaft turns, it moves a magnet. And so the moving magnet goes in and out. Comes around, in, out that would naturally make electric field one direction when it's going in and the other direction when it's coming out. And that is how our wall plugs work. Our wall plugs all make these huge magnetic fields, not because there's some battery stored out there that's not the same as charging up your phone. This electricity comes because of moving magnets. There's like Hoover Dam over here and they've got these giant magnets and the water flows out of the dam turning the magnet and that goes through a coil. That big wire is strung all the way across the desert out to us and we have our electricity going left, right, left, right, left, right. And so that's why I'm trying to say here is some circuits are DC and some circuits are AC. And so we'll start our conversation with, hey, some are AC. We won't really get into how magnets make the AC. I just need to convince you that there is then this alternative here, which we call AC. So we're going to do this. In place of the symbol for the battery, we'll put a little round object like a moving magnet on a wheel and we'll put a little squiggle in it, a little tilde, to kind of indicate here, here is our alternating current. 
or alternating voltage. And so we would have something that maybe looks like this if I were to plug it into the wall. And so this device right here, let me disconnect my light bulb so I don't confuse what I'm trying to say, but you'll see that this device is plugged into the wall. And so this piece of equipment I would describe with a little circle with a tilde, and this then is my power supply, and this is then the plug. This is where I've plugged it in. And what would happen is the current and the voltage would follow this kind of path. And so if I plotted, say, the voltage as a function of time, I guess I would put it in a math equation and I would say something like this. V as a function of time. Now I hope my little squiggle kind of looks like a sine function because that's exactly what you've learned in your math class, right? In your trig class. If you take the projection of a circle onto the vertical axis, you get a sine function. And so that's exactly what happens without getting into too much detail if you take a magnet and you make it go in a circle. If you make it go in a circle near a coil, you're going to get an electric field that goes plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. And it's going to follow a sinusoidal shape. And so I'm going to put the equation and the first thing I'm going to put is a sine function. And of course, maybe not a surprise, But the current then would follow a sine function. And so it goes plus, minus, plus, minus. And now let's put some numbers in here. Uh, if you, again, remember a little bit of your math class, I guess this would go back to your algebra class. If I had the function f of x and then I modified it, and multiplied it by a constant out in front, I'll just call it A, well, what does that do to a function? Or how about this? What if I have a function and I modify it by multiplying it by something inside the argument? What does that do to the function? Well, in case you've forgotten some of your algebra here, this one is the easier of the two. Doesn't this just make it bigger on the vertical axis? Often we just call it the amplitude. So what I'm going to do is say my sine function has some peak value, some amplitude. Right? This is, this is how high it would go. Some maximum. And I guess my currents would have the same kind of logic. See, because without that factor, uh, if you remember from your trig class, a sine function just goes up to 1, down to negative 1, up to 1, down to negative 1. By throwing in that factor, I can then have the ability to go up to 2 volts, or 3 volts, or 5 volts, or like our wall plugs, they go up to 170 volts, and then down to negative 170 volts, and then up to a plus 170, and down to a negative 170. And so this number here would be 170 if you're talking about a wall plug in North America. All right, now it would have to change with time, so there'd be a time factor. And this one you might have forgotten a little bit from your algebra class. What does this B do inside of the argument? It stretches and compresses it along the x-axis. So it's going to make it squiggle more or less. And, and so if B is a, a, a big number, it squiggles a lot. <laughs> if B is a small number, it stretches it out. All right. So that number here is the amount of stretching. Because again, 
if I don't put a number here, then a trig function repeats every 2 pi. And in North America here, our magnets are designed to rotate around 60 times in one second. So what we call the frequency is 60. We say you got to go around 60 times in one second. And so if you remember that from the last chapter, the, the frequency is that factor of 60. So I would say that I need an F right here. The bigger the F, the more the squiggle is. Uh, however, we got to be careful with our math here because if I say something goes around 60 times in one second, so its frequency is 60, on a trig function that would have to be 62 pi's, right? So that's why we would have a 2 pi factor in here. All right, so when we talk about AC, this is how the equation we're going to use. We're going to use an equation that has some amplitude. It's going to be a sine function. And then it's going to have some frequency. And that 2 pi has to be there because of, I'd say, the difference between humans and math. Uh, humans, we talk about how many times every second. We talk about the frequency. Whereas math talks about how many 2 pi cycles are there. And so 60 means, from a math perspective, 60 times 2 pi. Okay, so... If I then say, how much power do I get? Then you can see that the current is changing and the voltage is changing. And so you would have the initial current, or I should say the amplitude of the current times the amplitude of the voltage. And then you would multiply the two together and you would have sine squared of 2 pi F T. And this is worth taking a moment uh, looking at because if you were to plot a sine squared, it does this. And so let me just look at a sine squared. It would go up to 1 and down to 0. And your author and myself, partly because we're out of time, I was going to say, that's like an average of one half, isn't it? And it happens so quickly, we forget about it. We don't even recognize it. It's hard to believe that these lights are going on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, 120 times a second. Current goes one way, then the other way. And so, in one cycle, it goes on, off, on, off. And then it does it again, on, off, on, off. And if you have a very fancy little probe, you can, you can actually measure the light going on, off, on, off, on, off. Okay? And so that's our circuitry. Don't break anything, Ron. What are you trying to do? <laughs> oh, trying to see it. These are the ballast. Oh, they got a constant ballast. So these might be a little newer. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so if you like, 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 and if you put on a shutter with the camera, you can actually then catch them go on and off. But, uh, you know, Ron's pointing out, they, these probably don't. I don't see the, the flicker when I try to make a, the, the effect of a shutter with my fingers. It probably is. So it probably has a ballast built inside. And, and then it converts the AC to D DC before it sends it to the lights. Yeah. What would be the advantage of that? Some people say it, even though the flicker is so fast that most people don't recognize it, some people say it does bother them. So. But there's no, there's no like, actual like, advantage? Or um, well, then you can use different gases inside that then have a better energy efficiency. Oh. So there, there could be an energy efficiency advantage or an indirect. So by making the light a DC, you could use like I said, different gases inside. Instead of using a mercury, you can use an argon, and then that can be more efficient. So, and then, and, and these are the, I, now that I look closely at them, they are the narrow ones, and so that's probably what they're doing. You know, not the, not the wide, I'll call it the old school fluorescent ones. Yeah.
the flash. All right, well, I better uh, finish this up here because there's one more, I think, example I want you to do. But here's what I want to say then. For an AC circuit, we're going to often look at the average power. So I'm going to borrow a symbol from your math class. We'll put a P with a bar over it for average because then we don't have to worry about this time stuff. We can just say it is I naught V naught times one half. Uh, we could even group it together and say take the maximum current and divide it by the square root of two and multiply it by the maximum voltage and divide that by the square root of two. And so in other words I'm going to take this average effect of one half and distribute it equally to the current and the voltage which sounds kind of weird you're giving it a square root of two but I just want to separate the causes equally and giving part of the cause to the current and equal amount of cause to the voltage so I'm going to take the factor of two and break it into two pieces which gives me a square root of two and then Here's what we're going to do is we are going to refer to this as the RMS. I'll call it kind of the effective voltage. So in other words, if we had a DC circuit, if we had a DC circuit, we would have just taken the voltage and multiplied by the current. There would have not been this other factor of one half because it wasn't changing on us. And so what we could say here is even though the maximum is not the same as the RMS. What we could say is if we had a DC circuit, this would be the current and voltage that would give us the same amount of power. And so we can do a comparison to what do we really have compared to what would be equivalent if we had something that wasn't changing all the time on us. And so that's kind of the the usefulness of it. In fact, this leads me then to the last two examples that I would like to do. How are we doing on time here? And let's see if we can do number 72 at least and see where that gets us. And so 72 says oh, what is the hot resistance of a 25 light 25 watt light bulb that runs on 120 volts AC. Ooh. Now, if I run this on 120 volts, uh, let's come over here and I'm going to then say that okay, so here is my average power. It is equivalent to the RMS times the RMS. And I uh, thought it might be good to grab this one because right here, when they say 120 volts AC, they're actually telling you the effective RMS. They're not telling you the maximum. So they usually give you the RMS. And so I'm going to put here 25 watts I'm going to put my current RMS and I'm going to put here 120 volts. And so this gives me my RMS current. And uh, I'm going to then take the 25 and divide it by 120 and get 0 0.208. And I didn't save myself quite enough time, but remember that a watt is an amp times a volt and so this is going to be amps and so that's the amount of current and then since they asked about resistance let me go ahead and put the equivalent of a DC. There's our Ohm's law and that's what I was getting at. It's really nice even though we have AC circuits to sometimes talk about what they are the equivalent to in terms of RMS and in terms of their DC counterparts. So this would be 120 volts divided by the 0 0.208 amps and so that's going to be the resistance. And so the 120 divided by the last answer is 576 volts.
And so hopefully not only do you see the calculation, but you can see the advantage of why we like to talk about what would the current be equivalent to, even though it's really not a DC circuit. So that we can go ahead and throw in Ohm's law here and say this is what it comes out to be equivalent to. And maybe I'll try to squeeze in the 73 because I think it's just a divide by square root of two. It says here, uh, certain heavy industrial equipment use AC power that has a peak voltage of 679. And it's pretty high. Like I said, our wall plugs, we're, we're used to a peak of 170. Uh, but this is some high powered equipment. It says, what is the RMS voltage? And so this is just saying that the equivalent RMS voltage is the 679 volts divided by the square root of two. And so if I take my 679 and divide it by the square root of two, I get 480 volts. And if you've ever had the pleasure or unpleasure, whatever it is, working in a big industrial plant, that's, you'll hear that all lot. There's these special plugs and they're, you know, all our factories in North America here are all 480 volts. And it's 480 volts RMS, so their peak is the 679. And so that's how you run your heavy equipment and your big equipment. All right, good. Well, we'll, we'll stop there. We'll uh, Say bye to both people online and uh, in person, and we'll see you guys over in lab in uh, about 20 minutes. We'll do uh, 11.10 again. All right.